Hello everybody and welcome back to Witch Fix. Today I'm going to be looking at a rare thing, an autobiography of a witch. Uh, it's called Witch Amongst Us and it's by Lois Bourne. Uh, a little bit of background on Lois. Uh, she was originally initiated into Gardnerian Wicca and in fact became the High Priestess of the Bricketwood Coven, which was uh, Gerald Gardner's coven, uh, which was based in Hertfordshire. And unfortunately, she did die in 2017. But she has written four books, uh, Witch Amongst Us, which is autobiography of a witch published in 1979, Conversations with a Witch, Dancing with Witches and Spells to Change Your Life. So this is her first book. And I have to say, it's quite interesting. I'm glad I stumbled across it. Um, I was recently disappointed when I read um, One Witch's Way, I think was the name of the book. It was a recent review, uh, which I thought was going to be more of a personal story, a personal kind of autobiography. It really wasn't. And so I was looking for something similar. I stumbled across this book when I was doing just a search on eBay and managed to find a copy, which is Ex Library. Uh, it is quite an old book, um, obviously, because it came out in 1979. And what I'm going to say first and foremost is that there is some stuff in it which doesn't really pass muster in terms of modernity. There's some stuff in there about India as a country and about Native Americans, uh, which might potentially be offensive. It's not like overtly racist, but it is potentially just not very PC or very informed. So go into it kind of forewarned. On that score. Aside from that, uh, however, the book is quite interesting and includes a lot of personal anecdotes and stories from her life, which is what I think makes it such an interesting and worthwhile read. Because, uh, as I said in my review of Village Witch by Cassandra Latham Jones, it's really interesting to get these kind of first hand accounts of people who were involved in Wicca and paganism for a very long time they're kind of like our elders in the community and it's really nice that like records like this uh, books like this actually exist um so without further ado i'm going to get into it overall the book isn't necessarily a chronological account of lois's life uh, it does have some stuff about her childhood and then more about her practice but there's very little information on her personal life and it doesn't really seem to follow like a timeline insofar as her life goes um, there are a lot of anecdotes they're not particularly placed in time um, and she does talk about acquaintances and experiences that she had in the craft quite a lot of the earlier stuff to do with her early life her childhood relates to the fact that she had these kind of innate psychic powers and these kind of led her into a consideration of witchcraft by which I assume is meant wicca um, just to distinguish those two things uh, and then she talks about that she talks a lot about psychometry uh, psychics mediums spiritualists and quotes quite a lot of different books which are I think kind of out of vogue at the moment uh, I don't really normally see a lot of people talking in like Wiccan groups or in indeed in modern Wiccan books about things like psychometry and things like that it just seems like one of those things that's kind of gone out of style a little bit and was perhaps more in vogue in like the 60s um, that being said I didn't mind its inclusion in this it annoys me when there are like books that are said to be like non-fiction books about how to practice Wicca, which focus on the idea that if you believe in this, you must also believe in these other 20 things like reincarnation, past life regression, um, psychic powers, astral projection, aliens. And that's not always the case. Not everyone believes everything. And what I liked about this book is because it's her own personal experience, all she says is, this is something that I experienced. And she doesn't make any grand sweeping statements about this is the only right thing to believe or this is the only logical thing to believe. She just says, these are my experiences. They're the only thing that I can speak to. And maybe if those experiences were wrong or influenced by outside sources or if there was another explanation for them, you know, I'll, I'll find that out in time. But for now, all I can say is this is what I experienced. Um, which I appreciated. Also, she doesn't really make any attempt to pretend that this is a book that is going to teach you how to practice Wicca. It's just a book about her life and her experiences, which is fair enough. Something that was quite interesting to me as I read my way through this book is something that I think crops up first around page 54-55. Um, Lo uh, Lois starts to refer to someone called Sonia, who is a black witch of her acquaintance. Um, throughout the book, um, 
Lois refers to herself as a white witch. She talks about the practices of white witchcraft and then also black magic and black witches. So again, I feel like a lot of people don't really subscribe to that kind of binary idea of white magic and black magic. But again, this is just her personal view and it's not something that she is necessarily espousing to other people. So I'm prepared to let that go. But I was quite interested in the fact that she has kind of a long standing friendship with this Sonia character and quite a lot of her stories involve people being sent to her by Sonia because Sonia doesn't want to help them or if they're cursed she thinks they deserve to be cursed and various other things but the fact that they maintain this friendship is quite an interesting idea and I did google to see if I could find who Sonia was or if she had written a book at any point but I couldn't find anything and uh, if you know anything about it please do let me know because I'd be very interested in reading about that. But I liked the idea that there existed a friendship and relationship between two people who practiced incredibly differently. Um, and that was quite an, a nice thing to read about. There are a, quite a lot of sections which are sort of ruminations on practice and um, just talks generally about how she practiced her own craft. So this is from page 92. If I think it is necessary, I will draw a circle of power around me, either physically with a ritual knife or sword or just mentally and work within it. There are other times when I know I can dispense with this. Some magic calls for a complicated spell and ritual, and with practice I have become proficient and know instinctively what is required in order to achieve a specific result. I seldom have failures. Sometimes the working out of a spell will be convoluted, but they are usually successful. Which I found really interesting, um, this idea that she kind of instinctively knew when to practice magic within a circle and when you didn't actually need to do the whole full circle casting because circle casting is something that I've kind of been moving away from uh, mainly because it just feels like so alien and kind of forced to me when I try and do it um, so it was quite interesting to see uh, that and a little bit of information about the fact that she didn't really think that it was necessary all the time uh, was quite an interesting idea to come across I also kind of liked the sort of nuggets of wisdom and personal experience throughout the book. For example, um, 96, 97, uh, she talks about helping uh, a woman who was constantly being like dumped by her on again, off again boyfriend who was, um, I think, maybe cheating on her with other people. And she'd keep coming around and, and begging Lois to do magic to get him back for her. And what she says is this. She disagreed with me emphatically. Of course he really loved her. He just didn't realise how much. In any case, I simply had to make him marry her. And she wheedled and cajoled and sobbed and cried. I said I was sorry, but I was adamant. It is often impossible to reason with a woman in love, particularly a continental woman whose emotional nature makes her overreact to everything. Sidebar, that is one of the comments that I said was sort of not PC and, and not really appropriate now, but... I'm going to breeze past it for the rest of the quote. She began to telephone me every day, weeping and telling me how unhappy she was. And although I sincerely sympathised with her and understood how she felt, I eventually began to find it rather wearing and decided the time had come for some straight talking. The onlooker sees most of the game and from what she told me of him and what I saw on a psychic level, I thought she was too good for him and I said as much. There was little else I could do for her until she wanted to drag herself out of that besotted emotional quagmire and saw him more realistically. All I could do was support her and listen to her and hope that with time the scales would fall from her eyes and she would see him more clearly and realise that marriage to him would be a disaster and to find herself another boyfriend. I find that quite kind of amusing. Uh, when I was a teenager, I used to have a friend who literally every time we did a circle would want to do love magic or some sort of spell to do with working out her love life, working out who she was meant to be with, getting the guy she thought she was meant to be with. Um, I think also anyone who's a member of like the online community will know that there are lots of people who come around just looking for love spells or putting up requests saying like, oh, my boyfriend and I are fighting all the time. I want a spell to make us get on. And it's like, well, if you're fighting all the time, maybe you need to address that and work on it. And maybe you shouldn't be in a relationship together if it continues. Um, so I found that quite funny and it kind of uh, tied into a lot of experiences that I could relate to. Um, but also is just generally quite good advice and the kind of anecdotal teaching that I was sort of looking for in a book like this um, to sort of draw on those experiences that she's had herself and that she's kind of teaching these like little lessons throughout the book. 
I found it interesting on page 101 that she asserts there is an unspoken rule that witches must never ask for money for themselves. Uh, she's referring to um, magically asking for money, not about asking for payment for magical workings. Um, but she says that she does like spells for other people, but doesn't do money spells for herself because of this rule. Um, I've seen kind of some people in the online groups that I'm in talk about how witches aren't meant to use magic for personal gain. Uh, I have asked them if they have a source for this, like if they've read it in a book somewhere, because personal gain is the phrase they use in Charmed when they say they're not meant to use their powers for themselves. So um, I've not really seen any kind of source material on this, but this does seem to suggest that there is kind of a, a code somewhere that uh, Lois was following to do with doing magic for yourself. Um, so I found that quite interesting to see. Although um, throughout the book, Lois talks about like learning from a coven of white witches and being a white witch herself, but although sometimes working grey magic, she does say that she would curse people if necessary. Um, she does seem to be quite practical in that regard. She isn't one of the people who say like, you must never work negative magic because she accepts that it's sometimes necessary. This is from page 129. The local newspaper reporter, who was so fascinated by the subject of wax images, had questioned me in barely concealed excitement as to whether I would personally ever curse anyone. I had considered the question with circumspection. I would have to be deeply hurt and mortally offended before I would resort to that sort of retaliation, I had said. I would have to think about it very profoundly and for quite a long time, and after having done that, if I thought I was justified, I probably would. But in any case, it isn't always necessary to curse people. Some people make their own curses. Um, I kind of like the some people make their own curses statement because it's kind of true. There are lots of people out there who like bully other people, make trouble for them because they are deeply unhappy themselves uh, or they're, they're just not very nice people because of experiences that they've had. And while I don't agree that, you know, you have to go around loving everybody's faults away, I think sometimes you can just leave people to their own terrible personalities and eventually they do get what's coming to them. And not in a sort of rule of three way, just in a sense of if they walk around being a bastard, eventually someone is going to be a bigger bastard to them. And you don't necessarily have to get out the big book of magical ass whoppings to make that happen any sooner. Um, but again, this is kind of um, interesting ruminations she has about her own practice. Uh, and definitely these are speckled throughout the book and make it a very interesting read. Uh, she also writes on page 144. My rejection of the exhortation not to neglect the things of the spirit was not an arrogance, but an attempt to balance the mystical with the material. I try to maintain this balance constantly through every aspect of my life, despite the fact that I am involved in magic and other supernormal activities. I endeavour always not to allow myself to become too imaginative or to be so carried away by my enthusiasm that I lose my sense of reality. Self-delusion is a very real danger in any occult endeavour. This is a, a prime example of some of the just common sense practical advice that is in the book it's not even offered out as really advice to the reader it's just something that she talks about having noticed in her life and something that she tries to do but I do find again in like online communities people will be like this candle that I had in my room went out suddenly am I cursed is there a ghost living in my sock drawer and people will be like there's probably a draft in the corner where that candle was and one person in a, an online group that I'm a member of actually said that they were tired of having um, their beliefs attacked by people. And I don't think it's attacking just to say, like, actually, it's probably this thing that happened or this might be a mundane explanation for what you're experiencing, as opposed to being like, oh, it's probably definitely a ghost from Constantinople that you brought back from your holiday with you. And it now lives in your wardrobe and it wants plum jam or it will never leave, which is what some of the comments are like, honestly, when you read them. Uh, so... I think the, the overall takeaway from this is that I quite like this book because I agreed with quite a lot of what she was saying in terms of it being common sense. And I really liked her down to earth look at her practice. It wasn't sort of airy fairy and only talking about the mystical side of the things. It was quite realistic. And although there were some things that she said which were kind of bordering on the inappropriate and there's one story in particular about um she meets a guy who is a self-professed satanist and she thinks that he's like cursed an item of her jewelry and various other things because they're her personal experiences and because she's not making a sweeping statement about like all satanists she's just saying this is how i felt at this time 
and so this is what I did. I kind of didn't have as much of a problem with it as when people say, oh, this person was a Satanist, so we had to just completely exercise their living space. She was like, well, this is what I sensed that he had done in this specific instance to this specific item that he had interfered with. And so this is why I did what I did. So I found that kind of tonally to make a lot of the book easier to take, even though there were some of the experiences that I thought, did that really happen? Did you really see like a condensing grey fog over the window that was like trying to make you go to a ritual that you didn't want to go to? Don't know if I really believe that that's true, but I get the sense that the writer completely believes it and they're not really asking me to believe in their version of reality. They're just sharing their story with me. And this is sort of nicely summed up in just the last little quote that I'll read from page 157. The craft is not a religion of intellectual belief by the many, based on the assertions of the few. It is a religion of direct personal experience and would fit the description of a mystery religion since its experiences are mainly for the initiate. Um, so I don't really agree that the initiate is the only person who has these experiences, unless you would sort of talk about like self-initiation for solitaries. But I do agree that it's not about, you know, the Pope standing there and telling you this is what God wants and this is how God appears to people and this is the rules and the accepted stories of how God exists. It is about these personal experiences that you've had. And as long as you're not asking anyone else to participate in your kind of fantasy version of reality based on solely what you have experienced and you insist that is real for everyone, then basically I'm happy for people to believe what they want, to write books about anything that they want. As long as they are only talking about their experiences, that's fine. Uh, in my view, which I think is why I enjoyed this book so much, is because she was basically just kind of sharing her experiences and not asking me to believe in them. She just was talking about it and sharing enough practical wisdom that I felt like I was still getting something out of the book, even if I didn't really um, believe in or follow the stories uh, in terms of actually thinking that they were real. So I do kind of recommend this book it isn't very long it's sort of just under 200 pages like sort of 199 pages and um it wasn't hugely hard to find there were copies on ebay for about five pounds it does seem to have been published in kind of a mass market way because i have a copy that was at some point in surrey library so i guess if you live in surrey you cannot get this book out of the library um but yeah you should be able to get copies of this around and i think it is worth a read just because it's interesting to kind of learn from someone else's experience, uh, which I think for solitaries like myself is not something we get the opportunity to do very often um, because we're not obviously in the coven framework where we have people who were initiated before us. And a lot of the people who say that they've been practicing longer than you online, you don't know if they have. And also a lot of the kind of attitude you tend to get from other practitioners tends to be quite negative if you're just starting out and just learning at least it has been in my experience so it's nice to have this opportunity to read from a book without judgment uh, without you know messy personal interactions of people trying to force their beliefs on you it's kind of nice to just sit down and kind of read a diarized version that feels more like a chat uh, more than a sort of a class that you're expected to pay attention to. So I definitely recommend Witch Amongst Us by uh, Lois Bourne and I will be checking out some of her other books if I happen to come across them. In the meantime, let me know if you have read any of her other books. I'd be really fascinated to find out what you thought of them and if you recommend them. And in the meantime, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!